Good Thursday evening to you. I'm Michael Miano, pastor at the Blue Point Bible Church, director of the Power of Preterism Network, and I have the privilege of being the co-host this evening for the Preterist Power Hour that we uh, offer up every Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. My fellow co-host is Edward Howell, a uh, fellow member here at the Blue Point Bible Church, and Edward, I'll let you go ahead and add whatever uh, titles you'd like to put underneath that, if you so will, and uh, also, uh, Edward, after you go ahead and share and say hi, uh, can you just go ahead and bring us into a moment of prayer? After, of course, say hi, say your opening thoughts, and then bring us in on a moment of uh, prayer to launch our Preterist Power Hour, please. Okay, hello. And uh, <laughs> um, I don't know what to say as far as an introduction. Um, besides, you know, it's an op a great opportunity to uh, be part of the Preterist Power Hour and to uh, allow the extended family besides the Blue Point Bible Church to get to know me as well as you pastor and that hopefully that that which is you know uh, I guess shared today would be a benefit and would resonate with those that are listening. Amen. And to uh, open up in prayer I'd like to thank and praise God for this opportunity uh, for those that are listening as well as those that would have liked to be here. Um, I, I pray for those that are being invited to uh, maybe randomly or, or, or attend more, uh, 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 take the advantage of being invited and um, uh, Blessings for all those that are hearing, good health, and and I pray that this will resonate and be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, brother. Um, you know, Edward, if you don't mind, I wanted to use something you mentioned in prayer there as just something to announce to our listeners. Mm -hmm. the, the goal of our Tuesday nights, well, the goal of any of our online opportunities, whether it's a Tuesday night, a Thursday night, which is tonight, um, and our Sunday mornings, but not so much our Sunday mornings. Let's say Monday morning, Tuesday nights, and Thursday nights. The goal is to always be inviting people to join us. Now, from time to time, we'll reach out and we'll invite particular guests. However, we wanna extend this time as a time, this hour, again, Thursday night is more particular, uh, this hour for study among those that would desire to study. So if you choose to join with us on Thursday nights, uh, you know, again, Edward and I will co-host and sort of guide the conversation, but we'd love to have other people join with us to study, to talk through the different points. All you simply have to do is go to Zoom and put in 698-689-7086. I'll say it one more time slowly. Uh, that way you could write it down. But again, put in 698-689-7086 and you'll go ahead and be brought in on our sessions. And we'd love, love to study with you. Uh, and, and of course, uh, it'd be always inviting people into the manifold wisdom of God. So um, with that, Edward, if you don't mind, I just want to take us to scripture over to Leviticus chapter 23 to give us a sort of precursor to what we've, you know, a reminder, if you will, of what we've been talking about here with the Feast of the Lord, more particularly looking at the Feast of Passover. So here in Leviticus chapter 23, starting at verse four, this is what we read. These are the appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And I'll stop there. Uh, and then actually, you know what, I'll continue on just to, there's two feasts interlocked here. Uh, then on the a 15th day of the same month, there's the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For the seven days, you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. But for seven days, you shall present an offering of fire to the Lord. On the seventh day, it is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. And uh, then we're getting into a, a new feast there. So I want to just stop there. Uh, Passover again. Uh, we know is this feast that Israel is called to remember and to highlight that they, the Lord took them out of Egypt. They were in bondage for 400 and, what was it, 480 years? I'm uncertain. 
something to that extent. They were in bondage for a certain amount of years, maybe even just be 400, but they were in bondage for a certain amount of years. And then they're taken out by the Lord's arm, by his power. And ultimately through, they go through a wilderness journey, uh, spending longer time in the wilderness than they needed to, uh, lacking their faith in many regards. That generation that came out of Egypt dies. Uh, and then they go into the promised land. But the night before the Lord took them out of Egypt, we know that they were told to, you know, kill a lamb, wipe the blood on the doorpost, and this would be the, the, the Lord passing over them. He would pass over them that night, and that final plague that came upon Egypt, the, the death of the firstborn, would not fall upon God's people. So Israel's told their first, very first feast that they're supposed to highlight is this Passover, to remember this very moment and to look back. So, uh, you know, one thing, Edward, I wanted to say, and I know we talked a little bit before the program, but I wanted to highlight something that I think is important. When you open up the Bible for uh, the average person in America, right? Uh, you open up the Bible and we read this portion. The next thing they're going to say to you or I, as Bible-believing, Bible-reading folks, is going to be, well, then why don't you celebrate the Passover? Because Edward, I, I know you and I, we don't do this. Right. So I got a question. Can you answer that? Do you feel that you could respond to that question? Like, well, why do we read that in the Bible? But you, Edward, you don't do this. Because first of all, that's Old Testament for the uh, first century Jewish people. Uh, they had to do that. Uh, as a foreshadow of what was to come, Jesus Christ. And That's being right. that Jesus had come and he's the propitiation for our sins, uh, we no longer have to uh, observe these uh, rituals. And plus, being a Gentile, you know, that really has nothing to do with me personally. It's for the people that were called, Jesus, uh, God's people. They were under the ordinances of the law of Moses in these things. That's, right. um, that's what I'm to say, basically. Well, that's Edward, I think you said it very well. I think what people need to understand is context, right? They need to read the Bible and they need to say, okay, because again, I, I think that's a big problem for people is that when they open up the Bible, they don't know where to start. They don't know what's going on. So mm -hmm. You know, that's why teachers are important. And Edward, I regularly appreciate that you bring that up. You highlight that. You've actually highlighted that here on Preterist Power Hour a couple of times, where having good mentors and teachers in your life is important. So um, that's because that's it. The only reason that's important is not because, let's say, I know more than you. It's just that I've spent more time in the biblical literature, in the historicity of the Bible, and seeking to understand that, that stuff. So it would help when you begin to read, if you have somebody that's sort of informing you on those necessary historical details. So that's, that's really what having a teacher is all about, to inform you in the areas that you might, you might be lacking. That's not to say the teacher doesn't have areas of lack or that they know it all, but rather just to help inform you. So my point is that we need that. We need that background information, uh, a teacher, somebody to inform us of the context so that when we open up the Old Testament, we open up the Bible, we're not saying, where am I in all of this? You know, what does this have to do with me? Uh, you know, uh, one thing I'll make mention of is the reason why I find this to be very important is, for example, I'm in the middle of a Christmas challenge. The Christmas challenge is to read the entire book of Luke up to Christmas. The interesting thing about the book of Luke is Luke is 24 chapters. So if you started on December 1st and you read through the book of Luke, you will literally read through the entire book about Jesus and the ministry of Jesus by Christmas if you just read one chapter a day. So obviously that's a great invite to anybody watching that you can uh, start today, just read chapters one through three, and then start tomorrow by reading one chapter a day. And you'll have read the entire book of Luke. So point is this morning in my reading, it talked about how Jesus's mother brought him to the, uh, according to the law of the Lord is what it says in Luke chapters two and three, that according to the law of the Lord, Jesus's mother brought him to the temple and offered him to the Lord. Uh, and then it said, according to the law of the Lord, they went up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So now somebody that doesn't know anything of any background, they would read that 
And they would say, well, why is Jesus and his family doing all of these ordinances that Mike Miano and Edward Howell and Blue Point Bible Church are not doing? Or any Christians for that? Well, not any, but a large majority of Christians are not doing. So I think it's important for us to always understand there's so much context. Like, you know, uh, I think I heard this joke recently about Jesus being a Christian, right? We, we talked about that at church, that, you know, uh, many people think that Jesus was a Christian. And the problem with that is, no, Jesus was a Jew. Christian means followers of Jesus. And we know that, as you rightly just noted, that Jesus Christ changed the game, so to speak. He, he brought about the, the, the fulfillment of the jots and tittles so that we would not need to be under the uh, types and shadows, but rather that we could understand the substance of faith, that we would not go by the law of the letter, but we would be led by the spirit. And, you know, so I, I appreciate the way you outlined it. And I hope that I added on to what you uh, had said there in that regard. You, you sure have, because as you had mentioned, if, if we were to observe any of the uh, holidays, feast days in its totality, if you're going to uh, observe some of the law, you have to be an observant of all of the law, Amen. 613 laws. You know, and if it was grievous and impossible for the Jewish people to uh, adhere to, you know, why would we want to uh, put that yoke back upon us? That's you right. know, when Jesus had freed us from all of that, you know, uh, and the reason why Jesus uh, observed the law was because he was the fulfillment of the law. And he had to prove that he was the only one capable of fulfilling the law. That's right. And I wanted to highlight something else you mentioned about the Jew and Gentile, because we understand that, you know, the Jews were under the law of Moses. The Gentiles were in ignorance, which we read about in the book of Ephesians. And they had they did not have God. They were without God, without hope in the world. Right. Whereas the Jews had these ordinances that, though they were intended to be a blessing, ultimately became death to them. That's why we call them in the uh, the Apostle Paul refers to the law of Moses as the ministration of death in yes. second corinthians so we understand the jews were under this system as you rightly pointed out there that they could not fulfill and in their lack of fulfilling it it became death to them and thanks be to god he supplies jesus christ jesus christ comes and fulfills that law in its entirety the righteousness of god and therefore not only clears the jews but as we talk about he atones the jews and propitiates the, the need for the Gentiles, where now he threw off, the word uh, propitiation means to throw something off. He threw off the need for a covering for the law of Moses because he became the very covering himself. Yeah, so for yes. us in Christ Jesus, we don't seek righteousness. We live in righteousness yes. in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. And we are righteous through the righteousness of Christ, not of our own. That's right. That's right. So Edward, uh, you know, when you think of uh, Passover, how would you how would you summarize Passover? Like, what really comes to mind for you? What is the importance of this feast in the mind of the Old Covenant Jews? And what should we as Christians in the 21st century, how should we look at this feast of Passover? I think this is where our part uh, uh, comes in, as well as for the, for the people of the Jewish uh, nationality or whatever, is the word remember. Hmm. Remember uh, how God had uh, redeemed, uh, removed them or, or had delivered them from Egypt. That's right. And how Jesus Christ had delivered us from sin and death. That's right. You know, that's the summary I see, the word remember. Yeah, and again, it appears again and again. Uh, that is the, the very much the significance of that word. Uh, of, the, of the feast is the word remembering. And um, if you don't mind, give me one second here. I'm having a, trying to do two things at once here with my phone and my computer and my phone is just not having it. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, with the, the goal of the, the feast is to highlight Israel remembering the power of God. You know, what, I, what always stands out to me in celebrating the Passover feast is the, the arm of the Lord. That's what it talks about, the power of the arm of the Lord, that it's by the arm of the Lord. And we know it's not talking about an actual physical arm of, of any person or, or being, but rather the very power 
the very uh, sovereign authority, uh, you know, of God was on their behalf and is ultimately what led them. It was not, you know, because again, we know even as human beings now in the 21st century, we oftentimes want to think, well, maybe that happened because of this. You know, have you ever found yourself in your own personal life thinking that rather than accepting the sovereignty of God, we find ourselves sitting there saying, well, maybe that was, maybe this good blessing that just came into my life happened because I, you see where you went wrong, or, or happened yeah. because of this rather yeah. than recognizing God. So I think what God wants them to do at the very, very beginning of their celebration of the year is remember, remember yeah. how you even got here. Exactly. And as the scripture says, all good things come from God. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, and again, that's what it's doing. You know, God was setting them up for success. Let's be clear that while the law of Moses became a burden, namely because the Pharisees and the religious leaders, rather than doing their best to keep it in spirit and in truth, they decided to add to it more and more you know, and, uh, and create more burdens for others rather than fully submitting themselves to the law. Um, the, the law was beautiful. The law is good. And there were things that were set up for them. For example, God wants you to always remember him. He wants you to rejoice always. So what he's going to do is he's going to set up right at the very beginning of your year, a celebration for you to do exactly that. And unfortunately, by the time of the first century, they had so subverted the very hope of Passover and of remembering what God had done for them. And they made it so much of an obligation and so much of a, you know, a trial, you know, even today, you know, I've talked with one of our deacons here at Blue Point about Jews in New York City. And if you see them on, on feast or if you see them on the Sabbath, they have so much anxiety to get in the house. It has become such a burden rather than remembering and again, I do think that sometimes obligation should be a burden in some sense, a holy obligation, if you will. Um, but at the same time, it shouldn't cause anxiety and frustration. Uh, you know, it, that, and that's what it had become by the time of the first century. And thanks be to God, Jesus Christ was removing the need to obsess over these feasts and these, these different details. That's the, that doesn't sound like uh, the peace that surpassed understanding. That, right. the, that the Prince of Peace had uh, given us. <laughs> yeah, amen. I hear that one. Absolutely. So, um, so again, I appreciate the way you outlined Passover, and I'm hoping that that's what we're giving people. You know, we've given you a host of resources on the website, uh, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, uh, in regards to the different feasts. And we began with Passover, and we listed them there for you. Uh, limited, no, what is it? Um, including but not limited to the sermons by Dave Curtis. Uh, we, we included resources from Dr. Don K. Preston. I included some of my own resources. And the goal would be as we develop more and more resources, we'll, we'll put them up on the website. So of course, these videos that we've been doing about Passover on the Preterist Power Hour, they'll be logged there for you as well. And you'll be able to get as, you know, the goal would be that if people really want to understand the will of God, and we talked about this a little bit last week, that the best, one of the reasons why we're studying the feasts is we can learn the very will of God. We can learn about the substance that God has provided to us by actually examining the different feasts. Like here, we're talking about the, the importance of remembering. If, if Passover is the importance of remembering and being still and knowing the God who, you, who you're supposed to know, um, then we're going to see as we go through the different other, the other feasts they're highlighting things that are important as well. So hopefully that's what this will be for most people is a resource that will sort of catalog the importance of Passover. And, you know, not only the importance of Passover to the old covenant Jews, but the importance to, of Passover to the 21st century Christian who understands fulfilled eschatology, who understands preterism. And I would and, like to say with the word remember is that uh, we're remembering this because these feast days, we can apply how each feast day relates to Jesus Christ. That's right. How, how Passover, how the angel passed over the doorposts that were uh, spread with the blood of the lamb. Mm -hmm. And how Jesus um, died for our sins. How, um, how, how does scripture go? Um, we're not um, con condemnation. Um, 
scripture? Um, what is it? There's no condemnation for those that are, Christ that are in Christ Jesus. Yes. So that spirit of death had passed by us because for that reason in that regard. That's right. You know, and again, there's so many great resources. All you really have to do is go to Google and put in Jesus Christ Passover, and you'll get a host of different articles that you could read through. Of course, those are written by men. So you want to do the necessary study. You want to, you know, you want to get underneath uh, the, the context of scripture, the narrative of the Bible. And uh, that does bring me back to something we also highlighted last week, which I, I appreciate you, Edward, had brought up was the Afikomen. In talking about the celebration of the Afikomen during the the Passover supper. Uh, really, in totality, what I see happening with Passover is a revealing of the mystery. You know, there was a mystery. There was, uh, the, the Afikomen is this mysterious uh, thing that's hidden at the beginning of Passover. And then ultimately, it's revealed at the end. And they have a whole game that goes with it where children go ahead and look for the Afikomen as it's hidden. And what that's highlighting for us is that the biblical narrative was God was unveiling a plan. A plan that, as the Apostle Peter says in, uh, what is it, First Peter chapter 1, that, you know, the prophets had searched and, and sought out the, the, the mystery of God. And it's through Jesus Christ that that mystery has now been made known, which the mystery is eternally fulfilling and satisfying life. And is that not a mystery? Again, the whole world would agree with us. How do I find a, a uh, eternally fulfilling and satisfying life? And the world has a host of different ways it will offer to you. But what we see through the story of God, beginning with Passover, is an unveiling of what, how you find that eternally fulfilling and satisfying life. So you see right here, right at the very beginning, what we're saying to ourselves is remember. Remember. And if that doesn't highlight the important, not only the importance of Passover, but the importance of why we're even doing this. Like, why are we, me and you, two Gentile men, uh, you know, well, we know there's neither Jew nor Gentile in Christ, so we're not Gentile men, we're Christians. Um, but here we are in Christ. Why are we talking about this old covenant feast? Because we know the importance of remembering. Exactly. Right. And, and again, if you choose to remember this um, as, a, as a feast, if you choose to, you know, I like to do that in my own personal life. I like to actually go about celebrating the feast. And allowing myself to uh, understand the, the cultural nuances and the details that come with celebrating the feast. So uh, if you do it once a year as a moment of remembrance, glory to God. If you choose to do podcasts and talk about it whenever you want, glory to God. You know that we, we shouldn't be uh, judging each other based on the, the celebration of the feast, but also we should see it as valuable. And, you know, if I might say this one last thing, Edward, um, so my cousin Vinny, he's a Messianic Christian messianic uh, jew i guess or uh, some rendition of that that phrase there and he sees the importance of the feasts he's taught at our church a couple times on the feasts he uh you know he has a ministry called open door ministries uh, where that's focused on the feasts and while he's a futurist i've always appreciated the the fact that he does see the importance of understanding the feasts and if you know what we're looking to do is maybe bring him on next week and talk with him through different points to see what maybe examining Passover can help futurists and preterists have a better conversation. And that's what I'm hoping to see. Mm -hmm. So um, matter of fact, um, Edward, I'm going to be quiet here for a moment and let you speak. And then I'm going to move in on a question and I'm going to, I know you're, you're already prepared to answer the question. you kind of already did, uh, but then I'm also going to share with what my cousin Vinny, Vinny DeBrico, uh, what he had said to me as I asked him that question, and that'll serve as a sort of a precursor to him joining us on the show next week. So as I was talking, did anything stand out to you that you wanted to make mention of? Well, um, I'm thinking after Passover, when they actually went through the wilderness and went into the promised land, when they made it into the prom promised land, what did they do then? They lived, right? They, That's right. They you know, till the land, they did what they had to do and things of this nature. And being that we're in the kingdom, we're to do the same thing, we're to live and things like that. And if we need instruction, you have Galatians 5 and you have, uh, is it Second Peter? Second Peter 1, that's right. Yes, so you have, you know, instructions on, you know, what's expected of us and how we're to live. That's right, <laughs> amen, amen. Um, so 
the question I posed to you earlier today and I put on Facebook and I also sent to my cousin Vinny was as we consider the historical feast of Passover and it's fulfilled messianic significance, again, whether we're futurists or preterists, we know that Jesus Christ came to fulfill the feast. Yes. Uh, what would you say in a comprehensive summary Passover is all about? Now, I know you mentioned remember, Edward, and uh, I'm not sure if you wanted to elaborate any more on that. But I know you had just shared on social media, and I'm going to read it and then let you elaborate a bit more. Uh, remember how God delivered his people from Egypt, as we noted already, and how Jesus Christ delivered those who believe in him from sin and death. Romans 8, 1, as you highlighted before. Um, you know what? Before I let you jump in, I'm just going to read what my cousin Vinny had said, because it's very similar to uh, what you said, Edward. Uh, he said, in one word, redemption. You could say John 3, 3, 16 through 17 has a big part in God's redemptive, redemptive story. And again, we all know that text. That's the text where it talks about, for God sent his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall, have et- shall not perish, but have eternal life. Um, Vinny's saying here that that text is what Passover was pointing to. Passover has a lot of special meaning. The father handpicked the one to be the atonement for our very souls. So um, again, we see that a big part of Passover is preparing the lamb. You know, you can't wipe the lamb's blood on the doorpost if you don't have the lamb. And what we see happening there is God starting a story of redemption of how he would provide the Passover. I believe it's 2 Corinthians that says, the Lord is our Passover lamb. Yes. And uh, so, yeah, Edward, I wanted to open up and let you, if you wanted to further elaborate, or even if you had any thoughts in regards to what uh, Vinny had said. I agree with him. (laughs) I agree. Uh, You know, but as far as a a future event, that, that, I don't know where that would come in. But as far as, you know, the feast day and... um, uh, John three sixteen, you know I agree. Mm-hmm. Amen. I do too. So that's going to be the goal next week. Is it's not so much to be divisive in the conversation, but to be understanding, to get a better understanding of what each other are saying. For me, what I might pose to uh, Vinny next week is, well, if the goal of Passover was about redemption, and the goal of Tabernacles being the final feast uh, of God tabernacling with His people. The question is, did Jesus Christ fulfill every jot and tittle that was necessary for these things to be, which would include the judgment, the coming, and the resurrection of the dead? These are jots and tittles that are outlined by the law and the prophets. We know the Apostle Paul says he preaches nothing other than the law and the prophets. So if the Apostle Paul's preaching expectation of things that were in the law and the prophets, are we still expecting them? Or are these feasts entirely fulfilled? And now we can understand that God did fulfill every jot and tittle. And now we're not necessarily bound to the feasts, but instead we can use them, as you rightly noted, to remember. So that's going to be something I'm going to pose to him. And again, we're going to send him the questions ahead of time and give him opportunity to mull them over and think through some things. And, and, the, and the thing is, the, the last uh, feast day, tabernacle, uh, if that not had occurred, are we redeemed? That's right. That's right. Are we tabernacling with God now? Yes. Is Revelation chapter 21 a reality or not? So again, you know, we're not going to, uh, let's be yes, clear yes. here. Uh, we're, we're not going to corner him or anything in that extent. No, but again, no. we are going to allow both sides. Again, I want to encourage everyone. If you've never watched my discussion with Pastor Robert Iannicelli, uh, that's available on YouTube, I would encourage you to do so because I thought that that was for me one of the most edifying times. Because again, it was two men that were willing to share their views. We knew ahead of time what we were going to be talking about. Yes. And we were able to break down our different perspectives and, you know, hopefully sharpen each other. Um, you know, and that's the goal. I, I hope we see more dialogue in that regard than debate. Yes. I, I didn't mean to corner anyone. No, no, I, I didn't think you did. Word, ah. As far as redemp- being redeemed. That's right. You know, three, uh, 316, you know, and if we are redeemed, we're redeemed. Very but good. if we're right. not, then we're waiting. And it's like, right. wow, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it does. It gets to the heart of what are we waiting for? 
you know, if, if I might make mention of something, um, well, actually, I have it in here in my outline. So, you know what, I'm not going to go too far ahead of myself. I'm going to keep us on track here. And then I'll, I'll be mentioning something in a little bit in regards to uh, that exact point that, you know, uh, what are we moving toward? You know, what, what is the goal? So uh, I'll get there. Uh, if you don't mind, Edward, I wanted to bring our attention to an email that I sent to you, uh, which was an article from David Gates. David yes. Gates being a, a fellow preterist, uh, he's put out a lot of great articles and video teachings himself. Mm -hmm. And I just want to share with everyone what it said and then um, have you and I dialogue a bit, okay? Sure. Okay. So he says this, and this was earlier this week, and I found it to be interesting because we were talking about Passover, and then I saw this post, and I said, wow, that, that fits right in on what we're talking about. Two of the most repetitive themes in the entire Bible are the exodus from Egypt and the promise of entry into the land flowing with milk and honey. These ideas, both in shadow and in fulfillment, had precursors, one being the people were in bondage prior to the exodus. Uh, the second was a messenger would cry deliverance from the wilderness. The third would be signs preceding the, the great exodus. And the fourth being a lamb being slain the day the 40 years began. So what he's saying there is that both the exodus and the entry into the land, well, the promised land. Yeah, the, and the pro entry, entrance into the promised land and comparing that with the Messiah you see bondage, a messenger, signs, and a lamb. And then he goes on to point out that both of the, the motifs, and motifs, again, bring us back to last week's Preterist Power Hour, where we talked a little bit about types, types and antitypes. First Corinthians chapter 10, for example, the Apostle Paul says that these things, talking about the exodus from Egypt, talking about their wandering through the wilderness, their entering into the land, these things were done as examples or as types upon you whom the ends of the ages have come. So uh, we talked a little bit last week about types and antitypes. So you see in, um, where is it? I believe in Colossians, the apostle Paul mentions how the feasts were a type pointing to the good things that would come. And uh, so again, we, when we're talking about motifs or patterns or pictures, uh, we're saying that there's smaller little pictures and patterns that are pointing to larger spiritual realities. And when we look at the Passover, uh, when we look at the, the Passover feast, the Exodus, and we look at the ministry of Jesus Christ, we see a 40-year wilderness period be beginning on Passover and ending on Passover. Uh, Jesus Christ was killed. Uh, well, let's look at the Old Covenant one first. We know that... Uh, they were led out of, the, out of Egypt, but then they had 40 years of wandering. Jesus dies on the cross on Passover, and then 40 years later comes as he promised and destroys Jerusalem as he promised. So you see the 40 years there. There were a 40-year period of miracles, intense miracles, uh, during the wilderness period that they no longer experienced in such a fashion in the land. Some might argue they didn't experience miracles. Some like me would argue they experienced exponential miracles when they got into the land. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that conversation, Edward, but um, you know, with uh, the Churches of Christ, for example, uh, Holger Neubauer, William Bell, uh, Dr. William Bell, uh, there's some difference in my understanding that I do believe miracles continued in the land. I believe that the people were victorious again and again in battle uh, was a miracle of the Lord. I'm very similar to, as I acknowledge that in the first century, there were miracles like people being raised from the dead, et cetera. But then you and I are led by the spirit of the Lord every day. So, you know, the miracles, in my opinion, did not cease. But I do believe that there was a particular period of miracles that happened in the wilderness that no longer happened in the promised land and vice versa. In, a, in the first century with the first century Christians, and then in our spiritual lives following that 40 years, I do believe there is a distinction that should be made. Um, and then just to continue on with the list, um, 40 years of manna and wonderful things being shown while in the wilderness. So we might say uh, Jesus was the daily bread for the 40 years. And then 
a sinful generation being overthrown in the wilderness, which again, we know the Exodus, the, the, the saints that were led out of Egypt, that, that generation did not prom receive the promised land. And we also know for the Christians though, ours is a bit different. Um, our generation was not overthrown. Our, our spiritual ancestors of uh, in that prior to that 40 years or following that 40 years of the wilderness, we know they survived in Pella, literally survived and spiritually thrived uh, as they as they dwelt in the city of Pella and survived and didn't have to suffer the persecution that came upon the Jews by the Romans. So um, again, we see these patterns with Passover. And again, while I'm highlighting all those, hopefully it is bringing us to exactly what you said, Edward, about remembering that we would remember all these things. We'd remember the first century. We'd remember what happened. We'd remember the Exodus period, et cetera. So when you read that article, what came to mind? What were some of the things that stood out for you? Well, <clears throat> basically what we were discussing and um, what's kind of stood out to me is, okay, for those who feel that the Old Testament is just a history book or something to that nature, and they don't feel remembrance is required. What they're doing is putting themselves back into bondage that we've been freed from through Jesus Christ without accepting him and thinking they don't need him, you know, but yet when things hit, hit the fan, then they figure, you know, well, you know, it's God's fault, you know, but yet they had nothing to do with God until, you know, things happen. Mm -hmm. you know and as ward uh spoke of thursday uh he was talking about when things happen and how you have a lot of prosperity type preachers preaching things of abundance you know you got this you know you give and miraculously you're going to get money in the mail things like this and when stuff like this don't don't occur then they figure you know we have a worthless god you know he didn't come through you know, but yet, you know, that they're, they're they're expecting things that are miraculous, but it's, it it doesn't uh, coincide with scripture. Right. You know, because if you know you don't work, you don't eat. You know, so it's like you're expecting something to come out of the air that you did not earn. You mm. know, it, you know things things happen. We do get gifts. You know, but a gift is not something that you expect, <laughs> you know, it's just given to you. That's right. You know, um, I forgot the point in which I was, oh, yes. And what he was talking about was that, you know, uh, peace only comes from Christ, that we know. Um, the, the object, I forgot the object of what it was uh, about people that, um or oh, uh, expecting things from god mm -hmm. you know uh oh and then they wonder why you know certain like bad things happen to good people and stuff like that and mm -hmm. board was saying that you know nothing comes without a purpose you know if you suffer because god makes because the, the title of the thing was christmas hermeneutics you know god uses evil for good hmm that he'll work, he'll work good out, out of it. Yeah. So if you were to suffer something ill, there's a purpose in it. God may not have put that on you, but he could use it for good. Mm -hmm. Testimony, he could use it like like the uh, the blind man, the blind mute or something, and the, and, the, and the apostles had asked Christ, you know, why was this man like this? Was it his parents mm -hmm. or something or the sin that he had occurred, that he has this. And Jesus said, it's for the glory of God, that right. God can be seen in it, you know? So can a person be content in where they are, you know, in all circumstances? Can they trust in God? You know, can they lean upon him? Because, it, because if we were to do everything on our own, we don't need God, <laughs> you know? So these are opportunities for us to lean on God and to express our testimony on how God got us through and hmm. things of this nature, you know. But. That's right. Well, you know, again, so we're seeing a continual theme here. 
uh, if we're, we're talking about Passover, but then we're also talking about the warp and woof of scripture, if you will, is to, about remembering. It's always about remembering. That's why as a preterist, something that regularly frustrates me is to hear people say, well, if it's all in the past, then what does that mean for us today? And I sit there and I'm like, well, that, that doesn't, that means you don't understand the, the Hebraic mentality of past things. The Hebraic mentality would say, these things happen in the past to cause you to live a certain way today. You know, so what we're doing when we're, when we're looking back as preterists to what Christ has accomplished for us, we're saying, well, that's going to cause us to live a certain way. That's going to cause us to remember God, to always rejoice in all circumstances. I appreciate you bringing up that, uh, that study by Ward. Um, matter of fact, as I mentioned, I'm, do, I'm reading through Luke. Luke chapters one through three so far. And yes, the Christmas. Uh... Yeah. And, and sure enough, one of the things that stood out to me in my reading today was the purpose for Jesus being born. Again, picture the social situation. Mary's pregnant. She's probably complaining. She's all over the place. You know, she's probably in pain. Uh, Joseph's probably frustrated. They just traveled so far. They're, they're on the run, you know. Um, so now they they arrive and they're trying to get a hotel. You know, I, I'm going to use modern language here. They're trying to get a hotel. Your wife's bickering at you. You know, you got all these things going on or well, it wasn't his wife yet, your fiance. And, uh, you know, you're really trying to get this whole thing set up. And then for some reason, you can't get a hotel room. You got to go stay in a barn, in a manger, so to speak. And, uh, you know, that's where your baby's going to be born is in this barn, in this manger. Yes. And Mary, you're blessed upon woman. You're yeah. Blessed right. upon woman. Oh my goodness. Come yeah. on. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's funny that you mentioned that. She definitely was thinking about Elizabeth's words at that <laughs> very moment. Like, yeah, call me blessed, all right. And But again, the lesson is there, that why was Jesus born in that manger? Well, that became a sign to the wise men. Remember, they're going to go and find a baby lying in a manger, and that's going to be a sign. And then they show up, they bring gifts, they give the amazing pronunciation uh, of who Jesus Christ is. And then actually the text does say, if you don't mind, um, it says, because again, again, I think there's a good lesson there to remember, something for us to remember. Um, so yeah, when they come to visit, oh no, that's, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong portion there. Um, Jesus' birth, so Oh, right. Exactly. This is what I wanted to point out. So they show up, right? Verse 17, chapter two, verse 17. It says, when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told to them about this child. So they're obviously proclaiming him to be the Messiah. All the things they heard, all who heard it wondered at the things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. So you see, there's your, your exact hermeneutic that you were talking about there. She had must have been very frustrated and stressed out and in pain and, and going through it. But yet here she's receiving the blessing and knowing all of this happened for a reason. Yes. God is sovereign. God knows what he's doing. Yes. And, and so, yeah, again, I, want to highlight, I wanted to highlight that Edward, because I believe that's a message that should not get lost. Yes, we're talking about Passover. Yes, we're talking about God being mighty. And if I may say this, I asked you the question earlier about summarizing Passover. What I would say in my summary would be this. God has done great things. God is doing great things. And God will continue to do great things. That's Amen. for me, it's Passover. So you, you see, what we're seeing a big theme here with this remembering is to ultimately understand the sovereignty of God. To be like Mary that remembered God is sovereign even in the midst of our calamity, even in the midst of crisis. The Passover, for as joyous as some of the celebrations may have been, was also, you know, done in haste as they ran out. The original Passover was not a pretty situation. Mm -hmm. It's something we can celebrate and we know the sovereignty of, that God moved mightily. And then, of course, in what we celebrate as the Passover as Christians, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ's ministry wasn't exactly what we would call pretty. Mm -hmm. You know, Christianity isn't what we would call pretty. Again, as much as we have this this amazing experience of Zooming and, and, and fellowshipping and rejoicing in our freedoms in America, our brethren are tortured, killed, and beaten all over the world. So I, what I see too, 
when Jesus being born in a manger, right? And that being a sign for those people to find him and give him gifts and to proclaim who he was. It's like every individual that has a purpose, every, rather every individual has a purpose and their purpose being where they are today and where they, where they will be going, you know, is, uh, is necessary to make up the body of mm. Christ. You know, uh, being that Jesus was in a manger, they, they had to go through whatever process they had to go through, you know, but yet it was, it was foreseen, it was, it was, uh, it was prophetic. Right. So what we're going through, I, I believe is also prophetic. You know, what we've been through, what we're going through, That's right, you amen. know, and we can use this as a testimony in some way God's purpose will be established. <laughs> right. right. Amen. That's it. And that that's, should be, that's probably the best comprehensive phrase that we could come up with, right? I mean, that, yes. that's the goal is to know that God is working through and through. You yes. know, not only is he leading you out of Egypt, he's with you in the wilderness. Not only is he with you in the wilderness, he's bringing you into the promised land. Not only is he with you in the promised land, but he's going to give you victory over your enemies. He's going to provide. He's going to, again, this is good news. This yes. is, and this is what these feasts are all pointing to. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, another thing I had highlighted uh, in what Passover is all about is God is with us. And that's something yeah. as we're talking about Christmas, that's something we, we begin to celebrate even more so during this season in knowing that Christ, Emmanuel, the prophesied Emmanuel, God with us, uh, that this has all been accomplished. And that hopefully, as we go about even our contemporary feasts, so to speak, Thanksgiving, harvest feasts, mm -hmm. Christmas feasts, New Year's feasts, um, we would be conscious of what these things mean. And also, matter of fact, another feast coming up is Hanukkah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I love to use contemporary feasts, contemporary holidays, so to speak, as opportunities to grow in the Lord. And, Amen. and I believe there's a Hebraic reasoning behind that. And if you notice, in all of this calamity and things that, that occur, you can find, you find encouragement, you know, God's purpose, you know, um, prophetic messages and things that, you know, that applied at that time, how we could use for, for us, mm -hmm. you know, in practical application, you know, if you see and you do the study <laughs> to understand, you know, the narratives and what's going on, you can find encouragement in it because people wonder, you know, how in 70 AD with the Romans and all of this, uh, at the end is uh, joy and things of this nature because it's encouragement to those that believed and those that are, are you know, recognize the consummation of what had, had actually occurred. You right. know, the, the raising of the dead the uh, coming of the sleep with Jesus and those that were alive that were changed, you right. know, from the old covenant to the new. And it's just, it's, you know, <laughs> you do the work and, or you listen to those that, that have the, the answers, you know, you find encouragement. That's right. Amen. You know, yeah. there's so much there, you know, and I want to use that as a great ending point there. Uh, speaking about narrative theology, um, matter of fact, what I had written down in my notes was uh, when we're looking at the Feast of Passover or we're looking at anything in Scripture, one of the easiest ways to study your Bible is to ask yourself, what does this tell me about God? When we understand the Feast of Passover, as we are highlighting here, it shows us the faithfulness of God. It shows us the power of God on behalf of his people. It shows us that God uh, uses all moments, even calamitous, trialsome moments for his glory and for his purposes. Uh, all of this is wrapped up in Passover, and it tells Passover tells us about our God. You know, Scripture, contrary to the uh, maybe over individualized, over uh, me centered culture, mm -hmm. Scripture is not to tell us about ourselves and what we're doing. It's to tell us about God and what He did. And you know, and I think that's important for us to take home. Matter of fact, uh, Daniel Rogers, again, a great Bible teacher, preacher at the. Um, unfortunately now the name's going to slip my mind um hickory street church of christ in arcadia florida 
Um, I actually had the opportunity to preach there last year around this time. We're literally on like the year mark right now and a uh, great congregation there as well. Uh, Daniel Rogers, he recently started a new website called thefutureofpreterism.com. And uh, he actually talked about his second podcast. He did, he's putting together podcasts. His second podcast talks about narrative theology. That's basically, well, his second podcast is actually his first because, you know, it's like introduction and then the first podcast. And it was actually about our hermeneutic of narrative theology. And if you don't like my statement of saying, you know, reading scripture and saying, uh, what does this tell me about God? I might encourage you to follow Daniel Rogers' three steps in understanding narrative theology. This is what he says. When you go through reading the scriptures, at every point, ask yourself these three questions. Where are we? Or where were we? Where are we? And where are we going? So if you, and I'm going to give you an example. Uh, with Abraham. So where are we? Uh, Abraham was a man that was called from his current hometown in Genesis chapter 12 to go to a new land. So now Abraham, he was, he was in an old land. He's in a new land. Where is he going? He's going to be, he's going to, obviously the goal was for God to uh, flourish his family, to bless him and to have him trust him. The Lord said that he would send him to another land and that he would bless him and prosper him, etc. We know that Abraham had his moments of doubt. So the story of Abraham is best understood by knowing he came from somewhere, he ended up somewhere, and in that somewhere, he was going to bless him. And, and then imagine if you do that with every portion of scripture. Jonah, where are we? Where, I'm sorry, I gotta, where were we? Yeah, I have to remember the past tense. Where were we? Where are we? Where are we going? Uh, Jonah, you could say, where, where were we? Well, Jonah was a prophet that was sent to Nineveh. Uh, where are we? Well, Jonah was disobedient and did not go to Nineveh. Where are we going? Jonah is going to Nineveh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and obviously that story unwraps how. The question would be how. Uh, and we see the miraculous working of God. So, um, again, I'd encourage everybody to do that. If not, uh, if I didn't outline it well, I encourage you, of course, to visit thefutureofpreterism.com and be blessed by not only the podcasts, but articles and video resources that Daniel Rogers has put together. And, and we're not to take our eyes off of God because every time that's done throughout scripture is calamity, is calamity. You know, because when the moment you, you look at your power, the number of people that you have behind you and you and you rely on that you will fail because right. it's god and god alone that's right amen amen well thanks be to god that we're on an hour of talking about his power not our own right yes yes all right well brother i thank you for your time i want to give you an opportunity uh just to go ahead and share any last thoughts i thought what you just said was a great way for us to end the program uh, yes and focusing on his power uh, with that, uh, if you have nothing else to share, I'll go ahead and close us out with our benediction and encourage everyone to look forward to next week's podcast as we'll be seeking to bring Vincent DeBrico on the program to talk a little bit about uh, the Feast of Passover and, and different uh, details that surround that, understanding that feast. Amen. All right. Well, brother, may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Uh, thank you, Edward, for joining with me on this program, for being in these doors, so to speak, uh, here with me on Zoom. And of course, we uh, thank those of you that are tuned in for this session. Uh, may God continue to prosper your understanding. Go in peace. Amen.